you know, earlier in, in Philippians, in chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. See, if we're all confident in the power of the resurrection, again, it takes away all fear, doesn't it? I, at least I know it does for me. I just go, okay, once I have in my mind what the scriptures say, that he's with me, all fear is gone. And then he says, if you guys could all with one mind strive side by side for the gospel, and we just go, okay, Jesus is with me. I'll go anywhere, Lord. He goes, you start doing that with zero fear, no fear at all of your opponents. You're only going to do that if you believe the resurrected Christ is there. He's the one that takes away all fear. All fear is gone. It's because he lives that I can face tomorrow. Right? It's because he lives that all fear is gone. And so, so then, when he says, when you guys would live in a manner worthy of the gospel and you lock arms, you're side by side of one mind, we're all saying, we're not afraid. He's with us. He says, then, the world is going to believe in their destruction and your salvation then they're actually gonna believe our message and actually even have a fear themselves of their own destruction. That's amazing. In a world where you, hardly ever anyone seems like they're afraid of their own destruction, God says, well, an empowered church will create that. Well, a united, fearless church, the enemy hates that. He loves when we separate, we divide on so many things and we're afraid and insecure and we go to every event nervous because we don't believe in the resurrected Christ. He loves that because he knows oh, if these guys get united and believe that Christ is with them and they're not afraid of anything, then what Jesus said would happen will happen, that the world's going to believe that he really did come. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says this in verse 1. He says, I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, you're going, wait a second. Paul just is saying there that he came in fear and trembling. Listen to what he's saying, though. In contrast to fleshly confidence, with, which would be, I've got a great speech prepared. I've thought this through, and I can out-talk them. I can convince them. No, he's saying, I didn't come that way. I came with a simple message going, okay, if you don't move, God, nothing is going to happen. And I, I, I tell you, there are times when I'll, I'll walk onto a stage and there's confidence in the flesh. Like, oh, this message is gonna kill it. <laughs> you know? There's just one illustration in the middle. I bet you I can get half of them to cry. Like, the, <laughs> right? That's what Paul says. Like, I could come 
And some, some people, that's enough for them. Man, if you come and you give me a few quotes that I can write down and tweet out, that's all I want. If you can tell me one story and make me laugh and, you know, and then throw a few scriptures, that's enough for me. If, if you could just get into some Greek words that I've never heard about and really tear them apart, that seriously is enough. And Paul's saying, I'm, I'm coming and I'm going to, I decided. It was a choice to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? He says, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He explains, he goes, I don't want to, earlier in chapter one, he says, I, 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 verse 17, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So there is a way that if I come up here in the confidence of the flesh, I will actually diminish the power of the cross. That's, who talks like that, right? To come up here with fear and trembling and with a simple message of the cross so that I don't take away the power. Because if I'm up here in Francis Chan just go, oh yeah, da, da, da. and Jesus is just like, the, the message of the cross somehow gets diminished by our confidence in the flesh. You see this in the scriptures. Whenever someone starts, God hates self-reliance. God hates the confidence in the flesh. Remember the story of or one of our favorite verses, right? Is uh, in uh, it's one of our favorites um, <laughs> in Chronicles. <laughs> See, he doesn't like that I could just quote it in the flesh. Um, <laughs> I forget if it's First Chronicles or Second Chronicles sixteen nine. Se okay, Second Chronicles sixteen nine. We know that for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this, for from now on you will have wars. What, what the context is, is what I'm getting at. If you know the context of that story, it was King, King Asa who was amazing because he relied on the Lord. And he defeated these armies way bigger than his. But then later on in his life, towards the end, he starts partnering with this other king. And God speaks to him through the prophet there and said, what are you doing? And he goes, because you relied on this king of Syria, you're going to lose. He goes, you relied on me your whole life, and now, because you're this mighty king and you have all this ability to, to, to partner with other people, you're going to rely on that? Because of that, he goes, you've done a foolish thing. He goes, don't you know the eyes of the Lord? He's looking for the one whose heart is blameless. But because you relied on this king, you're going to lose and you're going to have wars from here on out. He hates that reliance on anything besides him. And that's why Paul says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to rely on. Paul was mentored by like the best. Like he was brilliant. He could have come up here and just had this amazing speech and talk people into these things. And if he had come, he goes, no, I, I decided to know nothing. I'm just going to go up there in weakness. I'm going to tremble. And I'm just going to give the simple message and believe that the resurrected Christ is there to do what he needs to do. I'm just going to speak his words because his words are living. And if I start talking, if Paul starts talking with his lofty speech, all of his wisdom, it's going to kill everything. I 
I'm sharing these things because I don't want fear to paralyze you. That's what the enemy wants you to look in the mirror and remind you because all your life it's been about working hard. You know, everything's been flesh. The harder you study in the flesh, the better grade you're going to get, the more you work out, the better you're going to do, you know, in the game. You know, everything's about like this work. And we are supposed to study and we are supposed to search the scriptures, but our confidence is like coming in weakness and trembling and trusting. Going, God, you're, you're moving in this room because I asked you to. And by your grace, because you want to move. And Lord, as your eyes are looking around, I really want you to pick me and say, there's a guy who really wants to die to himself and have me live through him. He really believes there's nothing he has to offer. Jesus says, it's the spirit, right? John 6, 63, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. We should be the most confident group of people because of who is standing with us and because of whose presence is with us. So get rid of all those lies that Satan's trying to plant into your mind that you could never survive over there. You could never pull this off or this. just get rid of that. That is all of the enemy. And believe the resurrected Christ is with you everywhere you go. And when you walk around with that type of fearlessness and we join arms and say, yeah, we're in this thing together, none of us are afraid. That's when we know the power of the resurrection and that's when the world's going to believe. But we have to be dissatisfied with lofty speech, eloquence, superior wisdom we just have to agree that's not enough for me you know I, I was reminded when we were praying this this afternoon of a, a psalm I just read a few days ago and it was really interesting um, it's Psalm 17 and when I read this I was like really Psalm 17 verse 13 says, Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him, deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children, and they leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. It's, it's such an interesting passage to me because it says, hey, deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, of men of this world whose Portion is in this life. So you're going, man, who is God? Who is he saying, God, please deliver me from these wicked people? And then he goes to describe them. They're, they're people whose portion is in this life. God, you fill their womb with treasure and they're satisfied with children and they leave their abundance to their infants. He goes, there are people on this earth that are happy just to have kids, make a living, die, and pass on their inheritance to their kids. And he refers to those as the wicked. And he goes, that's not enough for me. He goes, as for me, I mean, for some people, they're satisfied with that. They're happy with that. And I think back to those days when I was your age and, and I just, I'm, a little, I'm just ashamed. I'm going, God, I think even as a Christian at that time, the only things I were, was dreaming of was like a, a, a family, a happy family and some kids and a, a home. These aren't bad things, but to be satisfied with that. Where he says, as for me, 
I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I'll be satisfied with your likeness. That's, that's the only thing that's going to satisfy me. It's, it's so similar to Paul going, I, I, for me to live is Christ. The enemies of the cross, their, their God is their stomach. Like whatever they did this one, they're satisfied by that. That's so weird. He goes, I, I want you. I want to know the power of your resurrection. I want to fellowship in your sufferings. I, I've got to attain to that, that resurrection somehow. So when this is over, man, I'm, I'm going to see your face and I'm going to attain your likeness. Like that's the hunger of my life. We've got to stop being satisfied with the things we can see. I used to be satisfied giving a sermon that people liked and having the people like it and walk away going, oh, that was convicting, that was good, that was this, that was that. And Paul says, man, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to see the power. I want to come because the the kingdom of God is not about words. Words. It's about a power and a demonstration of the Spirit. And that's what I've been praying for. God, could, could tonight be a demonstration of the Spirit's power so everyone leaves there knowing the power of the resurrection? I, I, can't, I can't give that to you. I can't talk you into that. I can't talk you into leaving this room and, and, and going to the most dangerous places on earth to share the gospel and get you to be unafraid for the rest of your life? No, but by the grace of God, he can do that. And that's what I'm praying for. You see, it's, it's a... I was sharing with some guys uh, earlier today just how, okay, like, I, heard, I love surfing. And... Uh, I heard that there's a place to surf in Waco. <laughs> and so I went on the internet because I had, someone told me there was a wave pool in Waco. So I looked it up and watched a video this morning. I thought, that's kind of cool, you know, because what's cool about it is when you have those man-made waves, it always breaks in the same place. You know, normally you're swimming out in the ocean. You don't know where the wave's going to come when it's going to come, how big it's going to be, what's going to bite your face off. You don't know any of that. And I thought, it'd be nice to just go in a wave pool and go to the exact spot where the machine makes the wave every single time, and you can wave, you know, just ride the exact shape wave over and over and over again. And I go, that looks kind of fun. Um, but I would get bored of that after a while. And, but as I was watching that wave, I thought, you know what? That's what we do in our church gatherings sometimes. We just know how to create a wave. We know when it's going to begin at 9 a.m. We know just at the height at 921. And then we know it's going to close off, at, you, you know, in these different places. And then we'll do it again. At, and, and, and it's just this, we can manufacture so much and be satisfied with it. I've done that a lot of my life because there's something about that where if I go to that wave pool in Waco, I, won't, I, I know it's not going to be horrible. There will always be something. Whereas there have been times I paddle out in the ocean hearing there's going to be a swell and you're sitting there. Lord, please, please, just one. God, please, come on, Lord. Oh, gosh. I, I prayed this morning. I did my devotions. I witnessed to the guy on the way here. You know, like... Can I just have a wave? You know, like, it's, it's, that's what you do sometimes. And it's like nothing happened. But you never have that problem in Waco. It's always going to show up. It's always going to be the same thing. And I just, I just feel like there's like this safety in some of our fleshly confidence to create something. And for many people, that's enough. And as long as that's enough for us, God's not going to give us more. And as long as we play it safe and use our human wisdom and eloquence to create some sort of wave that's manufactured by us, and as long as I'm happy with it, you're happy with it, God's like, all right, fine. That's all you'll get then. 
But that wasn't enough for Paul, and I don't think it's enough for you, and that's why you're here, and it's not enough. That type of wave that you can create through your own learning and strategy is not enough to sustain you, not even close. And who wants to do that over and over and over again, ride a wave that we created? Rather than saying, God, like Paul, I'm going to go out there. I'm just going to paddle out. And if you don't do something, I'm just going to be standing there. I'll just be sitting on my board. But if you create something, you can create something so beautiful, so amazing. So that's, that's what Paul was saying to the church in um, Thessalonica in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1. <clears throat> he says in verse 4, he says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so we don't need to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul says, okay, when I came to your town, when I came to your city, he goes, I know God chose you. I know he created a wave. Why? Because the result. He goes, you, you started just the gospel. When I spoke it there, there was like this power and there was conviction. He goes, it was in a time of persecution. And yet when you heard what Jesus did on the cross, you took it with full, you're like, you know, okay, bring the persecute. These people heard the word. I'm like, go ahead, persecute me. I don't care anymore. And Paul's going, man, he goes, I didn't even have to tell people what happened in your life. You started preaching. You started preaching to everyone, and everyone started talking about you and how you turned away from idols to serve God. You were imitating us. You were laboring. It's like, he goes, man, something happened there. Same message. He goes, but with you guys, something happened. There was a wave. There was a wave. As yesterday when I was hanging out with Jimmy, he was just telling me about the times when, because when that wave comes, when the spirit moves, any strategy will work. You know? It's, it's not like, it, it's, just, it's, it's just when that, when God isn't moving, we try to manufacture something. And so then you got to get real clever and make something look like a, a semi-revival. You, you know, and, and it's just to say, God, I don't want that. Lord. I want to see this. I want to see your spirit move. I don't know how that's going to look in these different places, but I'm not satisfied with anything other than the power of the resurrected Christ. I was um, speaking with a couple friends of mine at this other conference a few months ago, and they spoke, and then I was going to come at the end, and, and it was all about getting people to go and, you know, into the nations, and, and I'm just like, I go, gosh, I just really feel like if it ended right now, they would all go, that was good, and then nothing would change. And so I gathered the two guys, I go, what do I say, what do I say to change that so that something happens? And we're sitting there plotting, you know, just the three of us, like, gosh, I don't know, maybe if I go this direction or this direction. And then it hit me, I go, wait a second. I go, this shouldn't be that hard. And I asked the two guys that spoke before me, I'm like, when the Holy Spirit entered you and you believed, did anyone have to talk you into spending time with him? Did people have to beg you to get the sin out of your life? 
was your pastor just all over you begging you to do something for the kingdom? I go, I don't know what it was like for you guys, but like I had to do something. Like when I, when the Holy Spirit came into me, it's like the thought of I can speak to Almighty God, like He'll listen to me. Like He didn't have to beg me to spend time with God. I wanted to be with something in there. And when the Spirit came into me, it's like all the sin that was in my life. I'm like, I want it out, get it out, get it out, get it out. I hate it. Every time I dabble just a little bit, ah, I don't want it. I, I'm not. I'm a new creation. I don't want that stuff in my life. Something inside happened. And I am not happy. I couldn't be happy just golfing and surfing every day. That would drive me nuts. I have to be about the kingdom. Like even now, like as the end is looking like it is just imminent, like it's happening. I'm begging God all the time, please get me in the game. Get me in the game. I, I'm begging Jimmy and Andrew, get me in the game. Where, where do I got to go? I got to do something because I'm not going to sit around like in the days of Noah and go, oh, I'm happy, you know, marrying my kids off. <laughs> you know, like, no. <laughs> No, I'm not satisfied with that, but it was something inside that happens. The Spirit is given to me to be his witness. So it drives me nuts when I haven't been my, his witness. It drives me nuts when I chicken out. I go, this is all, it was happening inside of me. I go, do people have to beg you? And they're listening, they go, you're right. No, something happened inside Something happened inside. You guys, our job should not be that hard. If you are pushing, pulling, dragging people for the tiniest bit of fruit, we've got to, out of love, be concerned that the Spirit of God and the resurrected Christ is not really in them, changing them from the inside. Because if the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is in them, what I hear is that your soul, your depths will cry out, Abba, Father. And you'll want to manifest the Holy Spirit of God. You'll want to be his witness. You will seek first his kingdom. You, you, when you see the poor, you can't just keep walking. How could the love of Christ be in you? Like it's all these things should happen as the Spirit enters us. So as you go to these other countries that you go, oh no, I'm scared of this, 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 this. No, there's only one X factor. That's the Holy Spirit. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead enters into these people, it's going to start happening from the inside out. And that's something that only the resurrected Christ can do who is with you. And if the Holy Spirit does not enter those people, nothing's going to happen. And you can spend all your days trying to protect them and talk them into something. When in reality, we need to be honest with people. When we don't see the fruit in their life, to say, you know, I'm... I'm nervous for you. I'm concerned for you because I don't see this power. So I, I even have to ask you, like, do you, from the core of your being, cry, Abba, Father? Does your spirit cry out to him? Do you hate sin and want it out of your life? Are you a slave to that righteousness? Is your mind about the kingdom and wanting so desperately to be a part of this mission that he's called us to? See, if that's not coming from inside and you need everyone and their mother pulling you, begging you, then I'd say, gosh, you may not know him. I say that cautiously, but out of love because this is about the power of the resurrected Christ. It's about people going from death to life, and there should be a noticeable difference. So don't put the pressure on yourself, thinking I'm not good enough to go and accomplish this in that tribe. If you do feel like you're good enough, man, that's exactly when nothing's gonna happen. It's, it's that confidence that you're not coming with fear and trembling. And you're not coming with this confidence that the resurrected Christ is with you everywhere you go. My prayer is that there's, I don't want to ever walk on another stage or share with another unbeliever with fear. 
I want to walk with this confidence that the resurrected Christ is with me. And that's a lot of power. That's all authority in heaven and on earth is with me.